Well, a very good evening to you and welcome to this, our evening service. Welcome to Cornerstone Church, Abergavenny. Whether you're a church member, whether you're someone who has attended regularly or whether you're just watching this online, you are very welcome to join us this evening as we come together to worship God. And this evening, I'll be preaching to us. We'll be continuing our series in Ephesians, and we've reached now chapter three of Ephesians. But first, uh, as we start our time together, our time of worship, um, let's read some words from the Psalms. I'm going to read from Psalm chapter 34. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Well, friends, as we come together to worship God, may we be people who come and magnify the Lord together. Maybe we be people who even this very evening taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, come now with me and magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. Although we are uh, each in our own house this Sunday evening, we can come together and sing as one voice, united by our faith and the Spirit of God which dwells within us. Let's sing together, Come People of the Risen King. <laughs>
Well, let's continue our time of worship together by reading from God's word. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to read the passage that we're going to be looking at this evening, which is Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 13. Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 13. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realised in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Well, again, as we continue our worship together, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together that we have this evening. We thank you that we're now back and able to meet together on your day, the Lord's Day, on Sunday mornings. And we thank you that um, even though it's difficult at this time, we're still able to have these services online together where we're able to um, uh, gather, although we're apart physically, we're still able to come together as one body in our houses, wherever we are and come before you in worship and in prayer and in your word. And we thank you for that. And we pray that this very evening you would be pleased to meet with us as we come before you. You would be pleased to work in us. Father, would you um, rebuke us and raise us up? Would you um, convict us and comfort us in the places that we need? You know Father, what we need, and would you provide for all our needs this evening as you work within us. Father, we pray this evening, would we see Jesus? We pray, we believe, help our unbelief. And Father, as we come before you in prayer, we think of uh, those amongst our church family who are um, suffering and struggling at the moment. We pray for all who are unwell and who are going through times of affliction at the moment. Father, would you Give them a sense of your presence with them this evening. Would you minister your grace and love to them? And would you help the rest of us to know how to best care for those people, to um, express our our love and your love for them, we pray. And for those who are unwell, Father, we pray, would you put your healing hand upon them and raise them up, we pray. And Father, as we come to your word in just a moment, would you again speak to us through your word? Would you meet with us through your word? Would you be transforming us by your spirit through your word? Father, would you be working in us to present us faultless before your throne because of what Christ has done when the day of the Lord comes? Father, would you make us more effective witnesses for you here on earth? Would you prepare us more for eternity that we um, might be equipped to praise you now and for the rest of time? Father, we pray. Build us up in love for you, in love for one another, in love for the entire lost world. We pray. We pray this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. 
Well, we're going to continue really in prayer as we sing our next song. Um, This next song is a prayer that God would speak to us as we come to his word. So let's pray and sing this song together. good it's ever faithful worth more than gold the heart's delight your word gives life to all who hear and obey your word endures forever your word is true it never changes It formed the earth, sustains it still. Your word defends, providing refuge and strength. Your word endures forever. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is a light unto my feet. Well, as has been said, and as we've read from, we're going to be looking this evening again as we continue our series through Ephesians. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 13. So turn with me there now in your Bibles. And as you turn there, I want to ask you a question. It's probably a bit of a big question for this time on a Sunday evening, especially when it's been so hot and sunny and you're feeling a bit tired, but bear with me. And here's the question to be thinking about. What do you see 
as being your purpose in life? I told you it was a big question. What do you see as being your main purpose in life? Maybe it's being a parent. Maybe it's being a grandparent, caring for your children and grandchildren. Maybe your main purpose is your job. That You see that as being the thing that takes up most of your time. That's your main reason for being here. Maybe you would say that your Christian faith is your main purpose in life. Maybe along with your commitment to church or your commitment to other causes and groups that you care about. Maybe as you watch this this evening, you're feeling a little bit lost in the world, not quite sure how you fit into the world anymore. Maybe you're feeling a little bit useless in the church and with your faith at this moment. Well, I asked that question about purpose because purpose is a big theme that Paul addresses in Ephesians. If you can remember back a few months as we started this series, purpose is something that Paul talks about in chapter one. And you might have noticed that he mentions it again here in chapter three. When Paul is talking about purposes here in this passage, he's talking about God in Christ's purpose for the world, for the church. But as we'll see, through faith in Christ, we become part of the church. And so God's dealings with the world, God's dealings with the church, his purpose for the church, for the world, really by extension is our own individual purpose as well. And so as we dig into this, we will get to see maybe something of what our purpose in life can be. So look with me at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul starts off by saying, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on your behalf, on behalf of you Gentiles. And then at that point you might notice in your Bible you might have a little dash there. And at this point, Paul gets distracted by that little opening sentence of our passage. And he gets distracted, really, explaining that sentence. He's explaining why he says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul realises, as he says that, that this is something that's going to take a little bit of explaining. Maybe you can imagine Paul in prison, a prisoner. And he's sat and he's probably dictating the letter to a scribe who will then uh, write it up nice and then take it off to be sent. And Paul, you can imagine him sat in the corner of his cell, reeling off this letter. And at this point, he thinks, oh, a prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles. What do I mean by that? That's a sentence that needs a little bit of explanation. Maybe you've seen those um, those clips from movies where the movie starts and um you see the main character and the main character is in a bit of a predicament and there's a voiceover that says, yes, that's me. But you're probably wondering how I ended up here in this weird situation. And that's what is happening with Paul here. He's explaining in this passage how he's ended up in prison and why it is that he says that he's in prison on behalf of the Gentiles. He says, I'm in prison on your behalf. That's a sentence that could make them feel a bit uncomfortable. If you had a letter from someone and they said, oh, I'm a prisoner on your behalf, it's a bit of a weird thing to say, isn't it? That's a sentence that needs some more explanation. Otherwise, you might worry about what you've done to land this person in prison on your behalf. So Paul goes off on one to explain how he's ended up in prison on behalf of the Gentiles. And this passage that we've got, Ephesians 3, 1 to 13, is that explanation of Paul explaining why he's in prison on behalf of the Gentiles and explaining ultimately, as we'll see in verse 13, why it's okay, why it is that the Gentiles in Ephesus don't need to worry, don't need to feel bad that Paul is in prison on their behalf. And we can dig in to this passage under three points, three headings that we'll see as we go. So look with me now, verse 2 to verse 6 verse 2 to verse 6. Paul goes off on one, there's the dash, and he says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, 
and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So just a reminder, this letter to the church in Ephesus, which is mostly made up of Gentiles, as we can see from this passage, is written by Paul. And Paul has history in Ephesus. We know from um, Acts that he spent a lot of time there. He was instrumental in the church coming to be and um, in the establishment of the church. And he, in Acts, we read of an emotional farewell that Paul has with the elders of the church in Ephesus. So he obviously knows them well. But we think by the time Ephesus, uh, by the time Ephesians was written, it had probably been about seven years since Paul had been in Ephesus. Now, I'm sure you can appreciate that in seven years, a lot can change. If someone had, um, if someone had left Cornerstone seven years ago, then there would be lots of people in the church now who wouldn't know who they were. And so for Paul here, he says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me. For you. Paul can say that it's probably safe to assume that most people have heard of him because of how instrumental he was in setting up the church in Ephesus and not just Ephesus but um, the whole of the area, all the churches among the Gentiles that were springing up across the regions out of from Jerusalem. Paul, that was his main role wasn't it in the early church after Pentecost, after his dramatic conversion from persecuting the early Christians on to preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, as he talks about in this passage. He can assume that most of the people in that church in Ephesus had at least heard about him, heard about his story, his conversion, and how he was converted by the grace of God. Paul makes clear to keep saying that it was the grace of God that saved him and that gave him um, this mystery. This mystery was made known to him, and then he was called to preach the mystery of Christ, to the Gentiles. Paul says this mystery was entrusted to him for stewardship. He had to look after it and make sure that he did what God wanted him to do with it. Paul says it was revealed to him by special revelation. It was revealed to him by Jesus Christ himself that he might go on and make this known to the Gentiles. And in verse six, we read exactly what the content of this mystery, which Paul is talking about, is this mystery that he was called to preach to all people and especially the Gentiles. He says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So we're starting to see how Paul has ended up in prison, why Paul has ended up in prison. Paul is saying, as you know, implicitly, this is, um, I was a persecutor of Christians of the church, but then I was saved. Then Jesus met with me and um, revealed to me this gospel, this mystery by grace. He called me to preach this to the Gentiles, this mystery. And this mystery is that the Gentiles, as well as what was previously the Jews, the special people of God. They could all come together as one body, as one group, as one church, as one gathering who would be the special people of God. The Gentiles are now fellow partakers. They're people who are welcome to the promise that is in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What Paul is saying is this mystery is the gospel that we know if we're Christians, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have rejected God, but now through Christ, through his righteous, perfect life, through his death on the cross, where he took the punishment for our sins, through his resurrection to new life, we, through simple trust in that, can come to God as his children. We have our sins washed away. We have new life, new resurrection life that becomes ours, and we can all become the treasured possession of God through that faith. And it's important to note at this point that this mystery that Paul is talking about, he's not talking about something different to what the rest of the Bible is about. Yes, he's talking that something was revealed to him. Something had been revealed to him by special revelation. It could only be made known by special revelation. But it's important for us to remember that this isn't something different to what the rest of the Bible talks about. 
it's easy, isn't it, for us to open our Old Testaments and to think that something, it seems often so different to the New Testament if we're not careful to spot how it links up. But we need to make sure that we understand that this mystery that Paul is talking about isn't something different to what was talked about in the Old Testament. It isn't something different to how people in the Old Testament were saved. But rather, this mystery is about the inclusion and the equality of the Gentiles, of people who aren't Jews, being made clear. That's what this mystery being revealed is. That's what this is talking about. See, this is just further clarity on content of the Old Testament. From the rest of the New Testament, we know that all of those things in the Old Testament were pointing towards Jesus. Um, When we read of the ceremonial laws and the sacrifices, they were all pointing to our sin, to humanity's sin, to ways that we were unclean. They're all reminders about how unclean we are before God, how we need to be separated from God by all of these different things because of our own sinfulness, our own uncleanliness, our own, um, uh, how we've fallen short of God. And those systems that meant that people could come to God through washing, through sacrifices, they were pointing to Christ, the true offering, the true sacrifice in whom those who trust in him become clean and have free access to God, as it says in verse 12, with boldness and confidence through faith. The Old Testament was pointing towards Christ. It was preparing for Christ, showing us our need for Christ. And now, Paul is saying, this has been made clear. You see, in the New Testament, when Paul talks about mysteries, and it's something that he talks about quite frequently, what he's talking about is simply something that needed to be revealed by God. A mystery isn't something that's unknowable, but it's something that is unknowable unless God has revealed it. A mystery isn't something unknowable, but it's something that is only knowable because God has revealed it. And that's what exactly what he did to Paul. He revealed it so that Paul could go on and preach it. And Paul is saying this because it's preaching this gospel that has landed him in prison on behalf of the Gentiles. So, some applications for this first section. Firstly, believe the mystery. Believe this mystery. It's simple, isn't it? We have to start at the beginning, and the first step is to, just to check ourselves and to reaffirm our faith in this mystery, to remind ourselves this very evening that apart from God, apart from Christ, we have fallen short. We've put ourselves on the thrones of our lives. We've chosen our own way and we have rejected God and we continue to reject him in so many ways every day. But we can believe this mystery that Paul has made known, that through faith in Christ, because of the righteous holy life of Jesus, the one who always kept God in his proper place, the one who always followed God's way of living, God's holy way of living, because of his death on the cross in our place, where he took death, which is the punishment for sin, upon himself, because of his resurrection to new life, because he didn't deserve death, he'd done nothing deserving of death, because he conquered death through his death, we can be welcomed into new and eternal life forever with God. So friends, this evening, whether you've never believed this mystery, whether you've never believed the Christian gospel, whether you've never put your trust in Christ before, or whether you have done, in our hearts right now, let's come again to him, confessing our need of him and bowing before him and saying, Jesus, you're the king of my life. I put my trust in you. Help me to follow you all of my days now and into eternity. Assure me of your love for me. And give me assurance that I will see you in heaven, face to face, and that we will be together in paradise forever. So that's the first thing. Believe this mystery, which has been unveiled. Believe the unveiled mystery. And another thing we need to do is just check that we understand this mystery again. Just remember that 
this mystery isn't about something different from the New Testament. It's not that the Old Testament means one thing and God is something in the Old Testament and then we come to the New Testament and something different happens and this guy Jesus comes along and everything's much happier and different. That's not how it is. And we'll get ourselves into a lot of trouble if we read our Bibles like that. In fact, half the Bible, over half the Bible, two thirds of the Bible is going to be pretty much useless to us if we see it as being like that. We're going to end up reading one half of the Bible as something which is either completely useless and we'll neglect it, or we'll read it wrong and we'll see it as being random lists of names interspersed by stories which have had good morals that we should follow, that have got inspiring stories or interesting stories that we can tell to our Sunday school children. But that's not what the Bible is about. That's not how we should read the Bible. When we look at the Old Testament, we should be looking at how it points to our need for Christ, how it prepares us for Christ, how it points to Christ. If you read the New Testament, it, you'll actually notice just how frequently the New Testament refers back to the Old Testament. In fact, it's pretty much impossible to properly understand Hebrews unless you're familiar with Leviticus. Paul, when he's talking about how Jesus was able to die on the cross in our place, he uses Old Testament references. He points to the sacrificial systems. And if we don't understand them, if we don't get that that's what is happening in the Bible, then we're going to read it wrong and it's not going to help us in the way that it should. And when we see it like that, we can actually look back at books like Leviticus and see how they can provide us with hope and comfort and help us to live. So we need to understand this unveiled mystery, this, this mystery which Paul has sought to make known and which has landed him in prison. We need to not read the Old Testament as a cookbook and the New Testament as a novel. No, we need to read it as one unified redemptive story of how humanity has fallen away from God by their sin. They've rejected God. They've turned their backs on him. But now, through Christ, we can come to him. Gentiles and Jews, through faith in him, have become his treasured possession. So believe the mystery. Understand the mystery. And then we need to be good stewards of the mystery, no matter the cost. This is Paul's own example. This is Paul's own story, isn't it? He's in prison for being a steward of this mystery, for preaching this mystery. And so at this point, it's only right that we ask ourselves, just quickly, are we going to be good stewards of this mystery? Having believed this mystery, having believed the gospel, having believed that we're sinners, that we need Christ to come back to God, having understood it, having understood that the Bible is one story about human sinfulness and the saviour, Christ Jesus. Are we going to hold to that truth? Are we going to be good stewards of that truth, no matter the cost? Are we going to preach it to our friends and neighbours? And I don't mean standing on a soapbox and shouting. Are we going to live it out? Are we going to speak it when appropriate and when we have the opportunity? Are we going to look for opportunities to speak this to our friends and neighbours? And as we live in a world which is increasingly antagonistic, to the truth of the Bible, are we going to be prepared to hold to this when it gets costly, like it did for Paul when it landed him in prison time and time again, when it led to beatings and shipwrecks? Are we going to be prepared to stand up for the truth of the Bible when it starts getting a difficult thing to do? There's a little question for us to ponder. And moving on, verses 7 to 9, verses 7 to 9. Paul says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages past in God who created all things. So Paul continues, stating again that it's through God's grace and power that he was called to be a minister of the gospel. And Paul goes further this time. He says he was called by grace to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. 
I wonder, what would you do if you logged onto your mobile banking app or you turned on your online banking or you were at the ATM machine and um, you put your card in and you went to check your balance or you go into the bank and you ask for a printout statement of your account and you look to the little place where it should say the account balance of your account. And instead of numbers, it just says the words unsearchable riches, unsearchable riches. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? You'd be pretty excited. And I wonder what you'd do first with that money. Well, really, if you found that you had unsearchable riches, what you did first with that money would kind of be irrelevant, wouldn't it? Because you could never run out. You wouldn't have to prioritise. You could do whatever you wanted. You could buy whatever you wanted. You could give away whatever you wanted. You could buy your children a house. You could buy your neighbour a car. You could give money to random people on the street and you wouldn't have to worry because you had unsearchable riches. Now, I don't think that's going to happen to me and I don't think that's going to happen to you. But Paul says that the Christian gospel contains unsearchable riches. That Jesus Christ, who ultimately is the Christian gospel, he is the good news that Christians have, contains unsearchable riches. And Paul is saying, really, that it's okay that he's suffering. It's okay that he's in prison because what he's in prison for is making known the unsearchable riches of Christ. Friends, I wonder, do you really believe this evening that Jesus contains unsearchable riches for you? Do you believe that? The slave trader turned pastor and hymn writer John Newton he was someone who loved to talk about the different things that Jesus was, the different names and roles that Jesus takes on in our lives. He loved to talk of Jesus as prophet, priest and king, as shepherd, as friend. But above all else, the one thing that Newton loved to talk about Jesus as was Jesus all-sufficient. Jesus all-sufficient. That was his favourite way of talking about Jesus. But I wonder, can we go a little bit further than that this evening? Can we go further than saying that Jesus was all sufficient? I want to tell you a little story about a family member of mine, a dear, dear family member of mine. And this family member of mine is very polite. She has impeccable manners. And I remember a time uh, sitting down to have a meal out with her. And we all sat down, us and some of the other family, and we had a starter and we'd have a main and you might have a dessert and you work your way through all of this delicious, delicious food. And as you can imagine, when you have a multi-course meal full of delicious delights, as time goes on, you start to get more and more full. But when time comes for dessert, if you're anything like me, you always have space for a little bit of dessert, even if it pushes you over the edge. And the end of the meal comes and what happens when you get to the end of a delicious meal like that? Well, you push your chair back from the table and you lean back and you say, oh, I am stuffed. I'm stuffed. And at that point, this dear family member of mine would turn to me and she'd say, James, it's rude. You can't say that. You can't say you're stuffed. You can't even say you're full. That's rude. What you have to say is, I've had sufficient. I have had sufficient. Much more polite, much more prim and proper. The only problem with that, of course, is that my reply was, had sufficient? I'd had sufficient about 20 minutes ago and I carried on going. I'm way past sufficient. I've had an abundance of sufficiency. Friends, I think when we think about Jesus, we can go even further than sufficient, can't we? Even further than all sufficient. And Jesus being the all sufficient one, that is, I'm not saying that it's not true. Of course I'm not. I'm going further. Of course Jesus is the all sufficient one and we can praise God for that. But he's more than just all sufficient. He is unsearchable. He's full of unsearchable riches. He's always fresh, always exciting, always applicable, always relevant to our every need and situation, our every affliction and struggle, whatever you're going through this evening, Jesus has something which can help you, which can lead you on. You see, when we talk about Jesus, 
and God. When we talk about God and his eternity and his infinitude, we're not just talking about how big he is, but that's referring to the riches of his character as well. Some of you will be familiar with the author, Jen Wilkin, and in one of her books, she talks about how when we reach eternity with God, when we're in the new heavens and the new earth with God, each and every day for the rest of eternity is going to be like a Christmas morning where we get to find out, unwrap the present of something new and exciting about God. We're never going to get to the bottom about what is great and wonderful and exciting about our God. I'm sure if you think about Christmas for you now, often Christmas is just more about stress and running around after the turkeys and making sure that running around after the children and cooking turkeys and making sure that your children and grandchildren are having a great time. But friends, let me promise you that when we get to heaven, that eternal Christmas morning, you're going to be like a joyful child as you discover new things about your wonderful, unsearchable God. That's what we have to look forward to if we're Christians. An eternity spent exploring the unsearchable riches of our glorious God and Saviour. So I have to ask you again at this point, are you believing that there are unsearchable riches for you in Jesus Christ? Are you feeling a bit bored or apathetic towards the gospel and towards church? Do you feel maybe that you've outgrown the gospel, outgrown Jesus? Or maybe you're not so much at that point, but you just feel like Jesus is not quite relevant to the situations or the struggles that you're going through. Maybe it feels like you believe that Jesus is real and that he loves you and that he died for you, but it's feeling like he's kind of helpless to help you in whatever situation and struggle you're going through. Friends, let me encourage you. Jesus does contain unsearchable riches. Let me encourage you that we must dig deeper into him. We must explore more of his character and what he's like and his feelings towards us as we see it in the Gospels. Just read through some of the Gospels and look for different ways that Jesus cares for the people that he meets and cares for you. Read books like Hebrews in the Bible that explore Jesus's heart for us. See Jesus as the prophet who rebukes us when we need to be rebuked. The priest who offers himself on our behalf, the high priest who can sympathise with our every weakness because he was tempted as we are, yet was without sin. See Jesus as the king who humbles us, who we bow down before. See Jesus as the good shepherd who sees us harassed and helpless, who sees us and walks us by still waters, who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death who doesn't leave our side as we stare death in the face, as we walk with loved ones who are staring death in the face. See Jesus as the friend of sinners. See Jesus as the one who embraces the prodigal. We need to see Jesus as all of these things. We need to see Jesus as the beautiful diamond that he is, that whatever way you look at it, it's just beauty shining. And do we realise that we have these unsearchable riches to share? That we can care for those within the church who are suffering and struggling by pointing them back to the unsearchable riches of Christ? That we can share these unsearchable riches with those who are far off as well? We have unsearchable riches in Christ, as well as this unveiled mystery that we've been looking at. And thirdly and finally, verses 10 to 13, Paul says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realised in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul is suffering to make the unsearchable riches of Christ known. And he's ultimately suffering, as we see here, to make known the ultimate purpose of God. He's making known to them the ultimate purpose of God. And part of that purpose is there in verses 10 and 11. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose 
that he has realised in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul was suffering for preaching the gospel so that Jew and Gentile, all who were far off from God, could come together through faith in Christ Jesus to be his special treasured possession, that they might come before him with boldness and have access with confidence to him. And Paul says, when that happens, when that takes place, it makes known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. When Jew and Gentile come together, come before God as the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known. And we as humans, as the church, fulfil our ultimate purpose. We know, we come to know, to glorify and to enjoy God forever, which is the very thing that we were created to do. So we're pretty much out of time. We've come full circle. Christian, Paul was suffering in prison so that he might make known to the Gentiles and by extension through God's inspired word to us tonight, the unveiled mystery of the unsearchable riches of God, which through faith help us to take our place in the ultimate purposes of God and find our ultimate purpose as humans. So however you're feeling this evening, whatever you feel your purpose here on earth is, whether you don't even know what that purpose is, here is a purpose that you can take hold of with both hands. Here is a purpose and it is to know and to enjoy God forever through faith in Christ, to come to him with boldness and confidence. And when you do that, you're making the wisdom of God known on a cosmic scale. Amen. Well, we're now uh, going to sing again. We're going to sing about the church as we sing uh, that hymn. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Let's sing together.
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in this church, in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever.